Hello, and welcome to this very first webinar of the America Europe Chair on Technology, Innovation and International Regulation, which has been created in September of this year, and which is an interdisciplinary initiative of the America Europe Fund at KU Leuven. What is this chair about? It is a convening chair that aims to bring together expertise at KU Leuven on technology, innovation and regulation. And its activities will include tracking, examining and comparing regulatory developments relating to technology and innovation in America and Europe. Complementarily, the chair will also promote opportunities for cooperation and learning between policymakers, business communities, civil society actors, and knowledge institutes on both sides of the Atlantic. Now, today is indeed our very first webinar, and it's actually the first webinar of a twin type of uh, seminar about EU and US approaches to regulating artificial intelligence. Today, the first webinar, we will have a distinguished European speaker about the European Union's draft Artificial Intelligence Act. Because indeed, in April of last year, the European Commission proposed the first legal framework on artificial intelligence. And the draft EU AI Act follows a risk-based approach whereby legal regulation is tailored to each level of risk. AI applications considered of an unacceptable risk would be prohibited, while those that are considered high risk would be subject to a set of legal obligations, including undergoing ex ante conformity assessment, being subject also to post-market monitoring and so on. Now, this is a major legislative initiative and the act, as is typical for the EU, is currently moving through the ordinary legislative procedure with the European Parliament and the Council. And in this webinar, indeed, we are asking Dr. Juha Heikula, who is a um, advisor for artificial intelligence in the European Commission, to share with us his um, analysis of the European Union's approach to regulating artificial uh, intelligence. In the next twin webinar, which will be held on Tuesday, the 8th of November, we will have a distinguished American speaker talking about the United States Algorithmic Accountability Act and blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. But that's for just two weeks from now. Today, we have the great privilege uh, to have among ourselves um, Dr. Juha Heikila, uh, as I said, advisor, on artificial intelligence in the Commission's Directorate General for Communication Networks, Content and Technology. He is focusing especially on the international aspect, but I should really say that we are delighted to have such a great distinguished speaker for our webinar because he has been very strongly involved in developing at multiple uh, instances the Commission's activities and strategy with regard to artificial intelligence and robotics. I'm not going to say what all these different phases were, but they were many. And uh, I should also say he's very well qualified to give this webinar because uh, he once upon a time studied computational linguistic research at the University of Helsinki. And he also holds a PhD in linguistics from the University of Cambridge. So we're really delighted that uh, Dr. Juha Heikula is with us today, and we're very happy to give him the floor. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Bautus. Uh, thank you for these kind words, and thank you also for inviting me to, to present um, the European Union, the European Commission approach to artificial intelligence. As Professor Bautus said, I am working on international aspects mainly, so um, um, I'm working in particular with the United States at the moment. Since we have the Trade and Technology Council you may have heard of, so I'm involved in that cooperation with the United States, but I'm also involved in other bilateral relations uh, that the European Union has in the field of artificial intelligence, so 
notably Canada, Japan, India, uh, plus also some multilateral uh, aspects. So the international aspect really is what I've been focusing on now for the past um, year or so, and that's where I'm active. Um, and uh, of course, uh, that is the, the sort of uh, angle you want to take on, on this. Um, in a way, uh, it's a pity that we couldn't be both here at the same time, the US representative and, and myself. It would have been nice to have this exchange, but uh, you will get the benefit of that, of course, then in two weeks when uh, the US counterpart will present uh, present uh, the, uh, the aspects that they find important and what they focus on. So I will be giving you a presentation. I have some slides which gives you an overview of the um, AI Act, its rationale and its principles. And I can then comment maybe from the international perspective at the end on, on some of the points that may be not so obvious. So um, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, I hope you will be able to I hope you will be able to see my slides. So it should be full screen now. If you could just give me a sign whether that uh, is visible or not. So you should see the first cover slide just now shaping Europe's digital future. And I move on to the first substance slide now. Can you see it? I assume it's perfect. yes, good, thank you. So why does the European Commission actually get involved in artificial intelligence? Why do we need to have a regulation legislation? Why do we actually need to be involved at all? Why do we need to uh, have some kind of activity in this area? So on the one hand, we do acknowledge and feel that AI can be a force for good. It can be good for our citizens. It can be good for our businesses. It can be something that works in the public interest. Uh, it enables us to address many societal challenges, and it will be uh, something which can actually uh, improve the quality of our lives. At the same time, however, it does create some risks. So. We think that there are, and this is well known, of course, certain risks which can be also considerable. And those risks are, in particular, uh, risks to the safety of users and consumers. And on the other hand, also, there are risks uh, to fundamental rights. Um, in order to give you the full picture, I should point out. Also, because I should have declared interest, I'm actually not lawyer by training, as may have become obvious from Professor Walters's uh, presentation or introduction. Uh, but to give you the full picture, I want to also talk to you about what else we published briefly, what else we published uh, last year in April. So we published a so-called, uh, what we call a shuffle communication in the EU parlance, and it consists of not just the AI Act, so a legal uh, proposal, but also the so-called coordinated plan on artificial intelligence. We did already publish that in 2018, and it's now been revised, it was revised in 2021. Um, it takes into account, uh, and I'll get into the substance uh, uh, presently, it takes into account the lessons we learned since 2018. It had lots of actions, around 70 actions, that committed the member states and the European Commission uh, to working together and uh, to, to promote and uh, advance AI. And we wanted to update this based on the pandemic and the Green Deal, um, and uh, also the Recovery and Resilience Facility and the new programs that, that came out. Um, and uh, what do we want to achieve with this? So to give you the kind of keywords here. This is what we call the ecosystem of excellence. On the other hand, we have then the ecosystem of trust, and that's the legal and ethical side of things. So in this coordinated plan, we wanted to make sure that we accelerate investments in AI so that we can drive the recovery uh, of the um, economic and social recovery. 
we want to act on the AI strategies that many member states have published and uh, other programs that, that are relevant so that we can then reap the full benefits of this. And we want to align the policy measures that are taken in the member states and the European Union. So it is to bring overall coherence and to, to, to put more weight, throw more weight behind it. And I'm not going to go into the details here, but this gives you the overview of the key policy objectives that we have. So we want to set the enabling conditions for artificial intelligence development and uptake. Uh, so this includes, for example, potential of data, we need to have the right computing capacity, uh, and we also need to, of course, pool and share the policy insights. Then we want to really push excellence in Europe from the lab to the market. So we want to make sure that all the key players uh, are connected and work together. Um, so we have set up a new public-private partnership in AI, data and robotics. We used to have a public-private partnership in uh, data and another one in robotics, but we brought these three communities, which are very closely related anyway, we brought them together and we want to bring them under the same roof. This started last year in the summer of 2021, and that's quite an important part of it. Uh, we want to further develop the research and industrial capacities that we have in artificial intelligence, because we have a lot of excellence in this area in Europe, but we want to push that further. And um, we also want to bridge the gap between the lab and the market. This excellent research does not always translate into uh, marketable products or innovation that will benefit uh, our citizens and businesses. That's why we are setting up testing and experimentation facilities, uh, which will help then um, test the innovations, see how they work in practice, and then improve them further. Also to see what kinds of policy implications they might have, um, so that this could be also combined with uh, regulatory sandboxes. Uh, so this excellence part, the research and innovation part is also very important for us. And, um, because the European Commission is also a very big funding agency. This is not necessarily known, certainly not outside Europe, uh, but that's a very important part of us. We've been involved in research and innovation in this area for a very long time, uh, almost 20 years, under different names, however, because artificial intelligence is a term that wasn't very popular until recently. So in, in the early 2000s, people talked about cognition or cognitive systems, um, uh, which most people are now happy to, to, to put under the same label artificial intelligence. But in those days, it wasn't a particularly popular term. Um, then, of course, we want to make sure that um, these technologies work for people. So we want to promote talent and skills. Um, and the kind of EU vision on sustainable and trustworthy AI in the world. And of course, then the policy framework, that legal part of it and the ethical part of it, which ensures trust in AI systems. And then the, we have identified a number of key sectors, important sectors, where we want to build a strategic leadership, like climate and environment, health, uh, agriculture, uh, robotics, just to name a few. Um, so this was the ecosystem of excellence part of it. And then I move on to the ecosystem of trust and the legal framework, which I think is probably of more uh, interest uh, to this audience, but I just wanted to mention also the ecosystem of excellence for the sake of completeness, because it's important to understand we want to uh, promote both sides of it. Already in the first communication on artificial intelligence, which was published in April 2018, we highlighted both technological and non-technological aspects of artificial intelligence. Now, why do we then regulate AI use cases? Well, there are a number of reasons for that, because AI systems can be very complex, they can be opaque, unpredictable, they have a certain degree of autonomy, more or less, and they use a lot of data. And these then lead to uh, a number of uh, uh, issues that we have to address. 
safety risks, obviously, risks to fundamental rights. So these two I already mentioned. But then there are also questions about enforcement, uncertainty about which legislation would apply, then mistrust or distrust in this technology and the resulting fragmentation. So these are all among the reasons that made us uh, think about regulation in this area and made us feel um, that it's important to do something about it. Maybe um, before I move on to the definition, maybe I'll just say a couple of words about fragmentation. So um, it's, a, it's quite important to understand that fragmentation is uh, something we absolutely wanted to prevent, and that could work at two different levels. So on the one hand, we would have uh, could have expected a fragmentation of the regulatory landscape. So the European Union being a union of 27 member states, there was the risk that individual member states would introduce and adopt AI legislation, and that would then uh, be uh, contradictory or uh, different in any case, uh, and that could lead to, to uh, problems. And of course, this could then lead to the fragmentation of the single market. So we have a single market, despite the fact that we have 27 member states, but that obviously was also um, at a risk if we had not uh, taken action here. So fragmentation at the legal level, but also then um, at the level of the single market. Now, the AI Act has uh, on purpose a definition which is as neutral as possible, and it aims to cover different kinds of artificial intelligence. So in these recent times, we've heard a lot about machine learning and deep learning. And a lot of the talk about artificial intelligence is about uh, these uh, machine learning and deep learning based approaches to artificial intelligence. But we wanted this definition to cover a broader set of systems, also traditional symbolic AI and hybrid systems. There is among the practitioners in the field, uh, a feeling that hybrid systems could well become much more important in the future. So hybrid in the sense of combining uh, these traditional methods of, of symbolic AI and machining, machine learning approaches. So therefore, the, the definition which underlies this AI Act is uh, broad. So it's software that is developed with one or more of the techniques and approaches listed in Annex 1 and can, for a given set of human-defined objectives, generate outputs such as content predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing the environment they interact with. Now, the pyramid here is a kind of uh, description of the risk-based approach to artificial intelligence. So we do not regulate artificial intelligence as uh, such as a technology, but we regulate certain uses of artificial intelligence. And uh, here the key, if we start from the bottom, there is the vast majority of uses of artificial intelligence where we think there is minimal or no risk, and those are permitted and can be put on the market without restrictions. Then the next layer, a smaller set of systems, is one which consists of the uses of artificial intelligence which have certain transparency obligations. So um, we need to know that we are dealing with bots, for example. Uh, so this um, uh, information needs to be provided. So certain transparency obligations, obligations to provide in certain information. Then, if you like, the core of the whole proposal is this high risk category of uh, AI, uses of AI systems. So they can be put on the market uh, if they are, uh, if they undergo um, uh, an ex ante conformity assessment. Uh, and of course, they are subject to a certain number of requirements. And then at the tip of this pyramid, we have those systems which are considered to be so harmful or completely. 
um, completely con contradictory with our values that they cannot be uh, accepted. For example, general purpose social scoring. So this small set of uses of AI uh, are prohibited uh, uh, according to this, uh, this uh, proposal. Now, um, I will not dwell on this slide very much because basically the essential uh, facts have been already stated. So at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, we have the unproblematic use of AI, um, but there could be codes of conduct, which, which could be drawn, drawn up on, on a voluntary basis. And then the transparency obligations that I've already mentioned for the second uh, lowest category. Now, the real substance, the essence, then these high risk systems, if you like, they come in two different categories. So we have on the one hand, the safety components of already regulated products. So these could be uh, products like medical devices or machinery, which are already covered by EU legislation. And these are then already subject to third party assessment under the relevant legislation. So the sector based legislation already intervenes here. And if AI is used as safety components of these products, then in these cases, um, these would be subject to um, ex anti conformity assessment, third party conformity assessment, the same way as the products themselves. But then there are a number of uses of AI uh, in certain fields where we feel that the risk of using AI is so high that we need to put them in this category of high risk systems and that we need to take measures. And these fields are the biometric identification and categorization of natural persons, the management and operation of critical infrastructure, education and vocational training, employment and workers management and access to self-employment, uh, access to essential private services and public services and benefits, law enforcement, migration, asylum and border control management, and the administration of justice and democratic processes. So AI systems, standalone systems, or components of other systems used in these fields have to undergo uh, the ex anti conformity assessment. So how do then products get uh, put on the market in the EU? They need to attain CE marking, and that's an indication uh, that the product complies with the requirements of EU legislation. Um, and for these high risk systems, the providers of these systems have to, first of all, determine whether this system is high risk as classified in this AI uh, regulation. So this is the Annex 3, which defines these um, the systems, these uses that I just uh, uh, enumerated. Then ensure that the development and quality management system, the design and development and the quality management systems comply with this AI regulation. Um, then they have to undergo this conformity assessment, uh, which assesses uh, and documents the compliance of this system. And then the system can have the CE marking uh, uh, fixed uh, as a sign of having passed the conformity assessment and it can be put on the market. So this is basically, these are the obligations that uh, providers will have to have to fulfill. Sorry. Um, so what are then the requirements that they have to fulfill? So they concern data. So the data used for training, validating and testing these systems. So that has to be sufficiently high quality, has to be relevant, representative, et cetera. They have to, uh, there has to be a certain traceability and auditability available. So there has to be documentation uh, uh, of the system and design logging features. Uh, we need also transparency and the right kind of information so users will have to know how to use the system. They have to have the instructions on, on how, to, how to use them. 
we have to ensure human oversight. So systems will have to have measures built in uh, or implemented by users in such a way that humans can oversee uh, the, uh, the um, uh, use of these systems. And the systems must be uh, robust, accurate, and they have to feel, fulfill the standards of cybersecurity. The providers will have to then establish the right kinds of risk management processes and this in the light of the intended purpose of the AI system. So it's the intended purpose here then, which, which is uh, a key factor. So the um, obligations then uh, on the providers, quality management system, technical documentation, logging obligations, conformity assessment, uh, registering the system in the database, CV marking, post-market monitoring, and collaboration with market surveillance authorities. Users then have to use these systems according to the instructions. They have to ensure human oversight, monitor the systems uh, for any possible risks, um, inform the provider of serious incidents, and of course, other legislation will continue to apply, for example, the uh, General Data Protection Regulation. So the life cycle and the relevant obligations. Um, so the design has to be in line with the requirements. Uh, again, here, the intended purpose, as I mentioned, is a central concept. Um, the conformity assessment has to be carried out ex ante. Post market monitoring, so collection, uh, collecting information, documenting, analyzing relevant data, um, and evaluating the compliance um, continually. Incident reporting, and then, if necessary, uh, um, new conformity assessment if this is required. Then, those uses of AI, the highest category, the tip of the pyramid, which are prohibited. So, there are four types of uses here. Subliminal manipulation resulting in physical and psychological harm. Exploitation of children or mentally disabled persons, which results in physical and psychological harm. General purpose social scoring and remote biometric identification for law enforcement purposes in publicly accessible spaces. There are exceptions to this, however, uh, in certain uh, well-founded cases. Specifically on remote biometric identification, uh, so it can be, uh, uh, it is prohibited for law enforcement purposes, except if it's used for searching victims of crime, if uh, the life or physical integrity is threatened, or if there is a threat of terrorism, and then uh, and certain other cases of serious crime. Um, and for this, there needs to be an ex ante authorization uh, um, for these particular uses. Um, and for the Putting on the market of remote biometric identification systems, there it needs to be a third party conformity assessment. So, in other cases, it is uh, self assessment, but in these cases, a third party conformity assessment. There are certain um, provisions in the AI Act which support innovation. So, there are provisions related to regulatory sandboxes. And there is also support for SMEs and startups. Um, and um, I should make a couple of other comments still on the AI Act. The risk, high risk category, if I go back to the uh, list here, this is renewable, revisable. So because this is an annex, this can be then adapted as necessary because this is obviously uh, these technologies are developing very fast and because of the developments uh, there are uh, 
not so many constants in, in this area. So we need to be able to uh, adapt and revise the list as necessary. So this is quite an important factor to keep in mind. To carry out some of this to, to support us, we are also planning to have a board which will then advise uh, the Commission on this and uh, see how this could be uh, revised and what is the best way of, of revising this. Now, um, maybe I'll just uh, add a bit to the process. Professor Bautas already pointed out that this is in the, in the political process. The co-legislators are having a look at it. Um, and uh, we expect the council to be uh, ready with its uh, its um, position quite uh, quite soon. Perhaps um, the parliament probably in the first quarter of next year. So the parliament is obviously going through lots of discussions about this, and then of course the the conciliation, the process of of coming to a final conclusion of this will probably take then the better part of next year. And then, of course, there is at least so currently a two-year transition period here. Uh, um, so then it would uh, start applying uh, two years after the adoption of this um, AI. So that's on the political process. Um, that's where we are currently with it. Um, I will not go into the discussions that are ongoing, what potential changes there are, um, um, because that is work ongoing. Um, it is obviously uh, a um, proposal that has attracted a lot of attention, both in the Council and in the Parliament. Um, and of course, uh, it's understandable, given this technology, that it does attract a lot of attention. Um, we'll then see how it will change, what changes there will be, but in essence, we think it will remain the key uh, pillars, the key approach will stay the same, the risk-based approach, we, uh, we do not expect to change, we expect most of the things to remain there, but then there will be discussion about some of the details um, and uh, uh, some of the finer points of it, obviously, I have been. So let's see where that will take us. Uh, we will be much the wiser in a few months' time. Um, and then, of course, uh, we know how it will come out um, just over a year from now, I would guess. But this is just an educated guess based on how things are moving. Maybe then some comments on the international aspects. So, um, Overall, we, uh, and this is stated in the coordinated plan, uh, so the, at the very first uh, part of my um, presentation, I explained this coordinated plan and the, the, the actions outlined there. Uh, we also mentioned international activities there. We do seek cooperation with, in particular, like-minded countries countries which also uh, advocate uh, human-centric, trustworthy artificial intelligence, uh, who support the responsible governance of artificial intelligence, and who want to have uh, guardrails in place uh, for this technology. Um, and therefore, we discuss with our partners outside the EU, um, and of course, we are also engaged multilaterally. We're engaged with um, in the OECD, uh, the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, G7 and G20. So these are the, the forums where the EU is active and is um, uh, also shaping the discussions with others. Now, one of the points that often comes up then is um, uh, the different approaches that different countries take. Um, in particular, often it is stated that this puts the EU at a disadvantage because we are regulating, whereas other regions at least have not yet done so. Well, uh, first of all, 
for us, it is important to strike the right balance between innovation and protection. And this proposal, we think, uh, does that. It allows innovation. It allows these uh, useful products and systems uh, to be developed. Uh, but it provides a certain amount of uh, protection where it's required. Hence, the risk-based approach. Hence, the focus on uses of artificial intelligence. Um, so not across the board, but where it's necessary and useful. That's where this AI Act is meant to intervene. Um, so for us, it's important that we get the benefits of this technology. But for the benefits of artificial intelligence to materialize, we need trust in this technology. We need uptake first, but we don't have uptake if we don't have trust. So a precondition for benefits is the uptake of AI, and a precondition for the uptake is trust. So therefore, we need to do things. Um, of course, one of the motivations for us is also to do AI in a way which feel, which in our opinion and according to the feedback we get, is right for Europeans. So obviously there are other parts in the world uh, where AI is used also for uh, sinister purposes, harmful purposes, and for suppressing uh, citizens. Obviously, this is something that we cannot accept. This is not in, uh, this would be in contradiction with our fundamental rights in the EU. Um, and on the other hand, uh, we also want to make sure that there are certain, uh, certain limits to the way that these systems can be used and, and developed. Um, I think it's useful to understand that things are also not necessarily constant. Uh, Canada has just recently uh, published uh, a bill which indicates their intention to regulate AI. It is um, similar in its approach to what we do. They talk about high impact systems, but it is quite comparable to the approach that we have adopted in the AI Act. Um, it's very early days in Canada, but nevertheless, they also feel the need to intervene. Um, other countries might follow suit. Um, uh, of course, the US is often held as an example of, an, of a country which does not regulate AI. Uh, but that is not quite true either, because uh, although the federal government has not taken steps to regulate AI, uh, individual states have done so. So there is AI-related regulation in, for example, the state of Maine. Um, there is also, there are uh, local uh, authorities which have done so. Uh, New York City has recently uh, introduced rules for using AI in recruitment uh, um, services. So there is also legislation there, though at a different level. Uh, and of course, there are still valuable aspects that we can discuss together with the US and other partners, um, although the regulatory consequences and conclusions could be different. So there is still there are areas where we can work together. Uh, standardization, for example, um, I did not mention it, but it should be understood. Uh, I should have pointed out that the requirements of this AI Act will be then implemented by means of standards. So the Commission is preparing a standardization mandate um, uh, for the European standardization organizations. Uh, which will then develop standards to uh, implement this AI Act or the requirements of this AI Act. So um, I'll stop there. Um, and in particular, if you have uh, questions related to the international aspects, I would be very interested to, 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 to discuss and, and, and answer them. Uh, but thank you very much indeed for your attention uh, so far.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Heikila. This was extremely illuminating and, uh, and clear. And uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we would be very happy to engage with you on a number of uh, uh, questions and issues. I'm also inviting our uh, uh, audience, our participants, uh, as has been uh, indicated, uh, you are free to put any questions or comments in the Q&A so that um, we, I can uh, take them up and discuss with um, our distinguished speaker. Um, as long as that is not the case, I hope I, uh, you do not mind me asking you a couple of questions. And uh, maybe the first question is something that um, you could expect probably in a webinar of this transatlantic uh, setup. And <clears throat> that is the following thing, namely, we know that um, uh, many tech companies are, of course, located outside of Europe, especially in the United States. And the question is then, uh, is there a so-called Brussels effect to be expected from the AI Act? And you know, of course, it's basically also somebody of your nationality. She's called Anu Bradford, the professor at Columbia University, has written this very great book about the Brussels effect. And um, basically, it's the idea that the European Union's regulatory impact goes way, way beyond Europe and actually affects the whole world. And um, making maybe a little bit of an analogy with what has happened uh, after the GDPR came uh, into force, uh, will we see something similar happening now with such an uh, European AI Act? Will we see companies voluntarily adapting their international products and services to meet EU standards? even when those products and services were also being offered to non-EU uh, markets. So what do you think about that? Well, I think the short answer is that that remains to be seen. <laughs> That's not a very satisfactory answer, I know. Uh, but um, indeed, um, well, let me just comment on the tech companies that you mentioned. So for us, um, this is obviously not targeting any companies, any players in the space. Uh, we are instead creating a level playing field. Uh, so those who want to put AI systems on the EU market, uh, they have to comply with this um, regulation once, it's, um, once it applies. Um, so regardless of whether they are inside the EU or outside the EU, and, uh, and it, it is not something that was crafted in reaction to any, any activities either. Um, now, the GDPR example, I think, is, is quite an interesting one in the sense that um, I remember some, some years ago, a, uh, a representative of a major tech company said that, um, that they 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 were happy to apply it also outside the EU because that simplified things for them in some respects. Um, and I think that uh, companies will then take decisions and they may may obviously take different decisions in this re regard. So they may take decisions as to whether they see it as advan advantageous uh, to apply this. Um, I think what um, the GDPR also, um, um, anecdotally, I can also say that I noticed that when it was first uh, published, it attracted a lot of criticism. So in public events um, uh, that I attended, I noticed that there was uh, a lot of criticism, particularly uh, criticizing it for stifling innovation, which is also a criticism that has been leveled at this uh, proposal. Um, then I noticed that uh, suddenly, suddenly after the Cambridge Analytica affair, uh, the mood changed. So the next event I attended, um, there were surprisingly positive things said about uh, the uh, GDPR. And um, I think that perhaps what happened created some kind of a mood change and the benefits of of the GDPR were also seen, uh, and the whole regulation was seen in a different light as a, as a result. So I think that there is often um, a first reaction which tends to be somewhat negative. Um, now, for, for this particular proposal, we've received both positive and negative reactions. Uh, if you get both, you might 
might feel that maybe it's not too far off. <laughs> but um, uh, so so uh, I cannot really say how companies would react to this. I think, however, what is important to companies, um, and it was the same conversation I had with a representative of a, of a tech company, um, that person told me it provides them with legal certainty. So they know, even if they might not like all the aspects of it, even if compliance might be sometimes tricky, at least they know what the, the, the rules are. So they know the name of the game. They know that's how it works. And then they might see advantages in applying it also elsewhere. And, um, and I think that uh, I mentioned fragmentation, and I think that's quite an important aspect there because uh, obviously, companies, be they European or non-European, they appreciate the fact that the rules apply the same way, way across the union. Um, and so that fragmentation would obviously increase the compliance costs of companies operating in different countries. Uh, so there is the aspect of legal certainty and the avoidance of fragmentation. Um, the US, of course, as I said, they have now some legislation in individual states. Um, the federal government level has not yet uh, proposed any legislation. It may not do so. Uh, but I think that uh, there is some fragmentation to be seen there uh, as, as a result of that. Um, I don't know exactly how then uh, the uh, the different levels of government, different jurisdictions, how they interact and work in the US. I can imagine that uh, so lots of lawyers uh, work on that uh, quite intensively. Uh, but at least we can avoid this. One question that I got uh, some time ago was that isn't this actually creating uncertainty because it's in the political process and it takes a while and so on and so on. Um, Yes, things are not ready yet, but on the other hand, at least the main pillars of what's coming up are known. Um, maybe I'll add just um, not so much from the company side, um, a point which may not be so obvious. So the risk-based approach, by the way, is also something that the United States has subscribed. So in the so-called Pittsburgh Declaration that was issued at the end of September last year, which kind of kicked off the Trade and Technology Council discussions um, uh, between the EU and the US, and AI is one of the topics there. So it was explicitly stated that both the EU and the US see that any measures taken uh, should be uh, uh, related to a um, proportional to the risk uh, posed by AI systems. Uh, so that is kind of similar, whether that is the influence that we brought or whether the US came to that conclusion in the, independently. I don't uh, want to comment on. Um, also, as I said, the Canadian, uh, Canadian uh, proposal is quite similar in spirit. Um, I don't know it's very well, I have to say, and I think lots of details are still very much open from what I heard. Nevertheless, um, I think that uh, that uh, uh, those uh, that approach will likely to be likely to be very similar, and um, of course, I think overall, some kind of a Brussels effect has become tangible in the sense that more and more countries are thinking about it now. So more and more countries are thinking about regulating or maybe regulating AI. So if nothing else, it has opened uh, the discussion on this in, in a concrete way, because there's a concrete proposal on the table. Uh, so of course, whether to regulate or not to regulate AI was discussed before, it's nothing new as such, but with a concrete proposal that we have put forward, uh, it is now clear that uh, the, the, uh, the, it's an element which, cannot be avoided, which will be commented on. It has attracted a lot of attention, not just in Canada, the US, but also in Asia, I've noticed. And overall, therefore, I think that uh, uh, it has opened a concrete debate on what to do uh, or what not to do about AI. 
Okay, thank you very much. And the good news after your ex excellent uh, further uh, uh, explanations, good news is we have a number of questions from our audience in the, in the, in the Q and A uh, box. And I, I'm, if you allow me, I will, will will quote from that. First of all, one of the participants is asking your views on the regulation of AI in courts and the judicial uh, systems in particular and notably what risks arise out of the use of AI in courts and how uh, the act in question addresses those risks. So here, of course, um, there is the risk of uh, bias and there is the risk of discrimination. So it falls into the category of uh, risks uh, to fundamental rights. And um, the um, administration of, uh, of uh, justice is in fact one of the high risk categories identified in the AI Act. So certainly this is something where any use in that area would have to be uh, uh, subjected to a, a conformity assessment. So we have obviously um, um, also some, some real instances from elsewhere, not from Europe, where this has become a problem. So we are talking about the fundamental rights uh, of, of individuals, their equal treatment and their, their right to individual treatment and justice. Uh, so obviously it's a problematic area. And uh, in that regard, it was felt uh, to, to, to be among those uses, those fields where the use of AI uh, should not be freely allowed, but it should be regulated. It should be part of the high risk systems. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have a couple of other questions. And one of them is the question, what would be the impact of this legislation on solutions that are already in the market after the transition period has passed? And would those solutions be subject to review too? Or would they be assessed based on post-market monitoring or the incident reporting system? So I think the latter is the case. As I pointed out at the beginning, I'm not a lawyer. So uh, the exact mechanism, I cannot really be um, 100% guaranteed to be how I see it, but the way obviously uh, the the uh, regulation would uh, apply, would, would start applying from a certain date and those products which are on the market then uh, would uh, not directly be affected. Of course, then there is the fact that these products can also uh, develop themselves, that is, they can be self-learning, they can uh, develop new functionalities, or the users sometimes can develop them further. Uh, and in that case, of course, then they could fall under the legislation, under the requirements, uh, under the provisions of this regulation, because they have then uh, become different in nature, and they might have to undergo conformity assessment. Then. Okay. Well, two more questions from our audience. We have a participant from Israel who is um, uh, noting, and of course, that's very true, that Israel is well known to be a startup uh, nation and that the Israeli government is at an advanced stage of developing an AI national plan, um, <clears throat> taking into account notably the approach in the EU, the OECD, the US and more. And so the question is, is there a, uh, between you and Israeli officials some form of cooperation or consultation? So with Israel, uh, obviously there is cooperation uh, in multilateral forums, um, but uh, there is also cooperation at the research and innovation level. So Israel is part of the research and innovation framework program, which is now called Horizon Europe, was called, was called Horizon 2020. So Israel has been uh, one of those countries which are not member states of the European Union, uh, but which has still uh, participated in the research and innovation program, has and can receive funding from it. So Israeli uh, participants, Israeli organizations can actually receive funding, can be uh, partners in collaborative projects, because these are typical collaborative projects. So that kind of cooperation has been going on for quite some time. 
uh, and uh, and there are lots of contacts, of course, between then um, uh, researchers and people working in on these systems and um, in practice uh, between Israeli organizations and uh, and European organizations. Directly bilaterally, uh, there are uh, no discussions related to the to the AI act as such, um, um, but uh, but there is of course this multilateral these multilateral forums where we do where we do of course have uh, cooperation where we do do have contacts. The startup issue, I see it more related to the excellence and innovation side. So as I said there. Of course, um, um, for many, many years, Israel has been part of the, of the framework program because Israel also pays into the budget. So it works along those lines. Uh, countries which are not member states of the European Union, they can apply to be associated countries. Um, and then uh, that means that they pay their fair share into the budget, but they can then take uh, part in the projects on equal footing. Other countries like that are Norway and Iceland, for example, so Turkey. So, so we have these partners outside the EU in this regard. Thank you very much. Now we go a little bit beyond this planet. We go to outer space because we have a question from um, a, a, a participant who works at the uh, McGill University's Institute for Air and Space Law. And the question is the following. Uh, is there within the annex or elsewhere any way proposed or being considered for regulation of AI in the space activities sector? And with the increasing impact of space activities, would it be considered as a critical infrastructure? Question mark. And the question is being asked because, of course, any impact in the space activities domain is very often irreversible. Uh, there is no reparation or compensation that is being provided. It's also, as is often said by space lawyers, space is the domain or the province of all mankind. And so in that sense, it becomes even more critical to regulate that sector also for the space activities domain. But how is the EU engaging in that uh, particular area? So um, there I have to say that I'm not the right person to answer that question necessarily. Uh, whether space is considered to be critical infrastructure, um, I think that boils down to the to the, the interpretation. It was probably not perhaps the first and foremost in mind uh, when this uh, this annex was was set up. Uh, I do agree, however, with the, the sentiment that it is uh, an increasingly important area. We have quite a lot of uh, activity uh, by colleagues who work in, we, we have a, a space program, we have quite a lot of activity related to, to, to space as such. And of course, AI is becoming an increasingly important part in, in those discussions. Um, and it could well be, for example, that in a future revision of the annex, this is an aspect that could be uh, taken into account. Okay, thank you very much. We are going to the end of this uh, webinar, but um, given your uh, great expertise on international uh, relations side of this whole problematic, can we look a little bit forward to the upcoming Trade and Technology Council? Eh? As you have also hi uh, highlighted, there have been previous discussions in the ministerial uh, meeting um, of the Trade and Technology Council that took place in May in Paris. The EU and the US agreed to develop a joint roadmap on evaluation and measurement tools for trustworthy AI and risk management. And we are being told that the first draft will be discussed in the TTC's December meeting in the United States. What can we expect from EU-US cooperation regarding artificial intelligence? So we're working on a number of, of uh, deliverables, if you like, in that regard. The, that particular one that you mentioned, this is uh, cooperation uh, with, uh, um, uh, with the National Institute uh, of Standards and Technology, so NIST. And we are discussing there, if you like, this is work which supports our standardization activities, our meaning both of us <laughs> on both sides of the Atlantic. So we are looking at uh, uh, having a shared understanding of some of the key terminology uh, to have kind of technology um, uh, vocabularies or, or lexicons and taxonomies. Uh, we are talking about 
uh, risk uh, catalog and what kinds of risks there are. We are not classifying risk because we've done this in the AI Act, and that's not the role of, of NIST. Um, and we are looking at maybe then uh, coming up with uh, a kind of re repository of methods and uh, uh, methodologies and, um, and uh, metrics for uh, evaluating, assessing trustworthy AI. So we see this as a way of um, paving the way for, for standardization. So if we have a shared understanding of some of the underlying issues, uh, that will then support standardization work on in the European standardization organizations and the international standardization organizations. So uh, that kind of a sort of convergence uh, is felt to be quite useful uh, on both sides. So that's now something that we want to you know, outline uh, for the next summit, which will take place um, in early December. So we want to outline a bit what we mean by that in more concrete terms. So that work has been going on over the past uh, weeks and, and months and will continue. Uh, but we're also looking at other things we are seeing if we have some kind of a sort of interesting pilot maybe on uh, privacy enhancing technologies, uh, uh, how those could be used. They, from our perspective, they don't solve the problems, of course, but they could help. Uh, legislation will be needed anyway, um, but uh, if that is a partial solution to some of the problems uh, that could be valuable. So we want to explore the, the, the value uh, and usefulness of that technology. And we also then look at how we can perhaps operationalize uh, AI principles. So we have both subscribed to endorse the OECD recommendation for AI. The OECD recommendation is very similar to the, uh, the, the uh, requirements published by the a uh, high level expert group on artificial intelligence that was um, that was uh, set up by the european commission so they came up in 2018 uh, with uh, the, the ethics guidelines and their key requirements so those are very very similar of course in many ways uh, with the oecd recommendation so that was something that was obviously then quite easy for us to to, to converge on in terms of the, the approach so we see if we can somehow then take this further and if we can somehow uh, find more convergence here. And something that is coming up out then also for the next summit is, a, um, is a, an economic study on the impact of AI on the workforce. So, so this is something that has been prepared uh, by, in, by jointly by the EU and the US, so on, on our side. Uh, DG employment has been in the lead for that and on the US side then the uh, Council of Economic Advisors has been involved in that work so we expect that to be ready and published uh, um, then uh, or submitted to the to the next summit um, so that's in a nutshell what we are doing and uh, we see that this uh, cooperation uh, particularly on uh, uh, risk management and evaluation measurement tools for trustworthy AI and that could be quite useful concrete work at a very technical level but nevertheless which will then support uh, the, the um, standardization work and pave the way uh, towards favorable standards um, and if we have agreement there with the US that we felt could be very beneficial to, to, to both of us. Dr. Heikila, we are very grateful for uh, this very open and uh, informative exchange uh, with you. In fact, there are so many interesting dimensions and issues that you have uh, touched upon and which we don't have the time now to elaborate, but which we hope we can uh, maybe uh, put on our um, discussion list for future webinars, because especially also this uh, wider international uh, coordination in various uh, organizations from the OECD to the G7, the G20, the global partnership, and so on. It's a fascinating kind of dynamics, and you are in the midst of that, so you're in a wonderful place to, to, to see all these uh, uh, developments. So thank you for engaging uh, really with us. I uh, want to thank also our uh, participants for raising those interesting uh, questions. All of this uh, smacks of much more, and I would say, and there will be much more because we are indeed intending 
to organize a, a great number of webinars in the future. The next one, as I have indicated at the beginning, is a twin uh, webinar, which will be take place on uh, Tuesday, November the 8th at 6 p.m. Uh, CEST. And that will be done by an American speaker. It will be about the US Algorithmic Accountability Act and the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. And the speaker will be Alex Engler, who is a fellow at the Brookings uh, Institution, where he uh, essentially studies the implications of artificial intelligence and emerging data technologies on society and uh, governance. So we very much look forward to the next webinar in two weeks' time. Before we end and draw this uh, webinar to a close, I would quickly like to ask um, our uh, collaborator, Joanna, to um, uh, uh, put on her screen because I would like to introduce her to uh, this distinguished audience. Uh, Joanna Gomez Berao is a research fellow at our Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies working at the America uh, Europe Chair on Technology, Innovation and International Regulation. She has been doing a marvelous job in uh, already putting this first uh, webinar uh, together. And uh, we're very grateful and um, the audience can count on the fact that uh, Joanna will be also very much engaged in the future webinars uh, of our America Europe Chair. So thank you very much again, Dr. Heikela. Um, uh, we hope to stay in touch with you. We hope also for the best for the AI Act and uh, that it may indeed uh, le uh, lead to um, a great uh, part of EU legislation that uh, <clears throat> will also have some, let's say, radiance in the world uh, in accordance with the teachings of the so-called Brussels effect, and that it will, in the end, because that is what matters most, that it will be a very good kind of balance between, as you have said, innovation, but also protection for the better good of all of our citizens. So thank you very much, and wish you all a pleasant continuation of your day. Or evening. Thank you very much indeed for your attention, and thank you very much indeed for this kind invitation. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.